Uh, Stephen, your new album To The Bone is out now. Uh, it's been an insanely busy couple of weeks for you, uh, so thanks for finding the time to do this Facebook live stream today. Uh, you've been rushing around all over the place in the last few mm -hmm. weeks. What have you been up to? Well, um, I was um, I was doing some signings and, and some uh, kind of performances. We did some in-store performances. I'm very lucky enough to have uh, Ninette with me last week in Berlin. And we did a bunch of things, record stores, radio shows, a, t a breakfast TV show, which was very strange, <laughs> uh, very strange experience. I saw the, I saw the video, it had like, uh, you know, yeah, in the surrounded, shopping centre, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> surrounded by, uh, by li li little old ladies eating their croissants, and <laughs> I'm sure wondering who the hell we were. Anyway, so that was, uh, that was last week, and then we, we flew back from Berlin, and we did the thing in the HMV, which maybe some people have seen, mm -hmm. um, and uh, an amazing, amazing turnout uh, to that. I think I was there for about two and a half hours, uh, meeting people and so yeah. which was amazing. Yeah, I saw, I saw the line, I mean, it just stretched around. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was, yeah. it was really crazy. Uh, which is great, you know, it's, yeah. uh, it's uh, what, a, what a fantastic problem to have, you know, the, the never-ending <laughs> line of people that want to you know have a signature um so that was amazing then at the weekend i was in st albans um doing another signing i'm doing another one tomorrow in in a store called press a store called um it's action Records. action records thank yeah. you uh in preston uh, up north because there was a lot of people saying well you know they couldn't get down to london or st albans and so we wanted to put something in that would kind of cover the sort of manchester liverpool leeds sheffield mm -hmm. preston and 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 so that's tomorrow um uh what else have i been doing uh made a couple of albums no uh, <laughs> produced a couple of records surprised. mixed a couple of records um no uh today actually is my first uh, day when i've had a little bit of downtime uh, which yeah. is nice but just just uh you know like stepping back in a way and, and just seeing you know yeah. what's happening and and uh it's taken on a life of its own now you know yeah. it's out so yeah. It's no longer really something I can control or influence. Uh, I mean, to an extent, I can I can still promote, you know, and I right. am. But um, how the album is received now, it's too late. If people don't like it, it's too late for me to do anything about it. So, <laughs> uh, but I think people seem to like it. So that's yeah. That's I mean, great. I've been looking at some of the comments, and uh, yeah. it's funny because how because how we release the singles, uh, people almost some people weren't too sure. And now those people that, that weren't sure are now saying that the album is one of the best you've ever made. But so, isn't isn't that yeah. always the way? You know, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I have the same thing because sometimes artists I like release, you know, preview tracks, and it's like I think I said in in, in I did an announcement uh, on the release day, didn't I, on Facebook? And I said in that announcement, like, for me, an album is like it's a continuum. It's it's a set of songs which form a whole, and and it's like watching a movie by just watching a, a scene in the middle or reading a novel by just reading chapter 12 yeah. and, and then, then putting it... And it doesn't make sense until you... I think until you really hear it. And I think on top of that, I was very sort of deliberately picking the songs that I felt were the most um, diverse. Yeah. You know, to, to give a sort of uh, a feel for how the album was. And it would have been, you know, it would have been very easy for me to just release the songs that sounded very familiar, you know. Yeah. But I think it was a conscious decision to release the songs that perhaps didn't sound so, um, you know, typically Stephen Wilson, if there is such a, if there is such yeah. a thing. So picking things like Permanating and Song of I, uh, which, by the way, songs I'm extremely, pr you know, proud of, partly because they're so different, mm. I think probably was deliberately putting you know the cat amongst the pigeons in a way and <laughs> uh, you know and also I've got to say that and I'm sure you'll agree with me here Rob all the controversy has been a fantastic help oh it has been yeah because it's created yeah. so much talk about an album yeah. Yeah. that you know some of it was negative some of it was positive but it's been um I mean, it's one of the reasons why why we've been so doing so well in the charts this week, <laughs> uh, is because everyone is talking about this record, uh, and I think people wanted to actually hear it, you know, because of all the controversy. I mean, honestly, I, I know I know people don't always believe this, but I really don't think about the fans or the management or the record company or anybody when I'm making. You don't it. read the comments online, do you? So and I d yeah. and, and I don't read any comments online and and i think you know there was a couple of fans that came this funny there was a there was a fan a couple of fans that came to me at the hmv signing and they said to me oh i'm so and so 
and and, uh, and they, I think they were waiting for me to say ah <laughs> that recognition and I was like okay nice to meet you so and so and they're like well don't you know who I am and I'm like no and I'm like and and ultimately I found out the reason they thought I might know who they were is because they post a lot comments and yeah. on Instagram and Facebook I really don't read that stuff. And and I don't want people to think they're wasting their time posting that stuff because you read it and you it, you yeah. filter it and yeah. you and and you feel and you, if there's anything that you think I should know and see yeah. you you will send it to me you know, yeah. but I really don't read that stuff and I don't think um, I don't think I should you know it, it yeah. it's it, I mean it's lovely to hear if somebody comes up to you and actually volunteers uh, that they like your record but to actually go searching for for criticism whether it's good or or yeah. bad or. I'm not really sure that's something that an artist should really be doing. You know? No, and it, it comes back to this debate of, uh, sort of comments on social media. I mean, you, you can get an awful amount of hurtful comments online. You know, people troll in the comments and they say, you know, terrible things. So sometimes it's but I like those. just to avoid it. Yeah, I, you those, like those. I yeah. like those <laughs> ones I like, yeah, because they make me laugh. But, but And I also have this, I'm, I'm, I'm very willful and I like... I like winding people up, you know. <laughs> One of the things about permanating is I knew it would upset some people, and I yeah. I really love that. But I think I think that uh, you know, and you're right. I think on a broader in a broader sense, I think there's a the problem with the internet. The way it's kind of it's kind of gone is that the minority that are negative have a much stronger presence than the majority that are positive. Mm -hmm. And I think that taps into something that goes very deep into, into human nature, is that bad news travels fast. Yeah. And if I, you know, I've always said that if I meet 100 people after a concert, uh, or let's say I meet 100, or let's say I do 100 concerts, and I'm, I meet fans after all of them, and I'm very nice and very positive and very friendly on 99 of the shows, and then on the 100th show, um, I've had a bad day, I've got a cold, I've had an yeah. argument with, with, with a friend or, you know, whatever it is that's happened, I'm in a bad mood and I'm a little bit short with the people that day. They're the people that will go on the forums and say, yeah. I'm an asshole. Yeah. And all the 99, the 99 shows where I was nice as pie to people, yeah. people don't tend to go and say, yeah. I just met Stephen Wilson, he was really nice and I want to say he was really nice. Yeah. But they, so I think it's something about the internet that encourages that... Um, that side of human nature yeah. that we love to say things to be yeah. negative. Yeah. Because it's almost like we love to it's because it attracts attention to us, you know. Yeah. Uh, we love to be controversial. So on the one hand, I'm saying, well, I've enjoyed being controversial and winding people up, and on the other hand, I'm yeah. complaining that. So you know, I'm a hypocrite in that sense. But <laughs> but I think that that's another reason why reading comments online is very, um, it's kind of irrelevant and rather misleading, really. Yeah, it is definitely. So, after all this activity with promoting the album, uh, are you going to get a well-deserved break? No. <laughs> uh, I start rehearsals on Monday with the band, and, and uh, people will say, well, why are you rehearsing? Because you're not touring until, until, until February. And the answer is just in case any TV stuff comes in, you know, because the yeah. album is doing fantastically well at the moment, and it, it's, it's definitely making some um, inroads into mainstream. So there's always the possibility, and, I, and I've discussed this with my... My management, my record company. It, what would what would we do if if a, if a yeah. big TV you know offer came in? So I'm rehearsing with the band next week. So at least we can, yeah. if we if we do get an invitation, we can go and play um, at least the material, some of the material from the new record. Yeah. So this week, actually, one of the other things I've been doing this week is been revamping my my guitar rig and and because mm -hmm. I used the very to, without wishing to get all kind of techy here, I used a very different approach to my guitar playing and my guitar sound on this record so I've had to completely uh, rethink my my rig and so yeah. yesterday I was down in in, um, in uh, Swindon where my uh, the, the guys that run gig rig kind of my guy, guitar guru you yeah. know Daniel down there yeah. uh, so sort of discussing with him my requirements for the next tour yeah. so uh, so that starts uh, so the guys in the band are all at home right now. Hopefully, they're all at home right now, learning their parts, because <laughs> a lot of them didn't actually play on the record. You know, most of the bass on the record is me, and and a lot of the keyboards are me. So the guys have actually got to go and learn. You know, my one finger gets the keyboard yeah. parts, and yeah. um, so Monday we start we start rehearsing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is the live band lineup now complete? It's widely known that Dave Kilminster is unavailable as he's on tour with Roger Waters. Uh, how do you go about finding a replacement for a guitarist of that quality? I did a lot of auditions this time around, and and um, you know it's not just a case of of um, finding 
the best guitar player on the planet. You know, it has to be someone that that is um, um, has got the right. You know, it's going to have the right chemistry to fit uh -huh. the band. It's going to be, you know, convenient kind of reasonably local I mean I've already got one guy that lives in America I have to fly around the world I I prefer I, would, I was kind of conscious that I prefer to have someone that's based in England at least um, the, I think the simple answer to your question is I ask around I yeah. ask around and and um, and I've eventually and I've, I've settled on a, on a guy a fantastic guitar player who was a friend of Craig's actually a guy called Alex Hutchings and Alex is relatively unknown, you know, outside of guitar circles. He's known in guitar circles. He, mm -hmm. he does clinics and he, he, demo, he demos for companies like Boss, I think. And, he, you know, he's known on that circuit. But in that respect, he's much like Craig because Craig was someone who was very well known as a sort of clinician mm -hmm. and someone who demonstrated gear but had never really been part of a, a regular band before he joined my band. And I think people have been blown away by Craig, you know, and he's yeah. took, it took a while. Every, every time you replace someone... This goes back to the old negative internet thing, you know, and I think that's, yeah. I warn everyone that joins my band, I warn them, I say, look, there are some people out there that are going to say, be very critical and say, not as good as Guthrie Govan, not as good as Dave yeah. Kilmister, not as good as Mark O'Minham, and not as good as Gavin Harrison. And I understand, you know, that there are some people who genuinely feel that way, which is fine, but it's, it's very hard to be that person in, in that situation. Being yeah. an exceptional musician, as these guys are, but still having to endure that. And I realise I've set the bar very high with some of the people I've had yeah. in my band. I've, I've been very fortunate to have extraordinary musicians. Anyway, Alex is amazing. He's going to blow a lot of people away. He's still going to get all that bullshit. I've, war <laughs> I've warned him. I've warned him he's still going to get all that bullshit. Uh, he's a very humble guy, and and, uh, and uh, he's going to uh, he's going to he's going to be uh, starting rehearsals with me on Monday in this yeah. band. Yeah. Well, one of the things I noticed about Craig was just, you know, at the start of the process, obviously there were a few comments online, you know, directed towards him. You know, a lot of people weren't happy about him, you know, filling Marco Miniman's shoes. But I've seen some of the blog posts that Craig's been putting up, and he's obviously, you know, proven everyone wrong big time. You know? Well, I think he had, you know, and I think that happened. And to be honest, that happened with Marco too. There was yeah. a lot of people at the beginning saying, you know, where's Gavin Harrison? You know, and yeah. um, they're all very different in style. And I understand that one of the things about, you know, one of the things about music, of course, is that it's not about, it's not an Olympic sport. Yeah. So it's about taste. And some people love Gavin's style. Some people like Marco's style. Some people like Craig's style. I used a drummer on on the album called Jeremy Stacy as well, who who's a fantastic drummer, who again has a completely different style to Craig. And one of the one of the reasons I use Craig on half the record, Jeremy on the other, is that they in some ways they couldn't be more different. Um, and so it's all about picking the right drummer for the you know for the right song, the right musicians for the for the job. Um, and I think what was beautiful about what happened with Craig is he silenced a lot of his critics, yeah. as Marco had before him. Mm -hmm. As Dave did with the you know the Guthrie Govan fan club and and you know this and the same thing will happen time and time again because I am a solo artist now so I can't always rely on the same musicians being yeah. available and by the way it wasn't me it wasn't the, the reason Marco wasn't in the band anymore was not my choice it was Marco was too busy and yeah. same with Guthrie and same with Dave so there's actually no point in people going on and saying yeah. not as good as Marco yeah. because it's not like I had the choice anyway you yeah. know. I noticed actually. I mean, you mentioned Jeremy Stacy. Uh, he plays some fantastic drumming on Nowhere Now on the album. Yeah, uh, there's that final bit, and he just is it's explosive. You know, Jeremy is like Jeremy is. I mean, I think Craig is more is a little bit close to Gavin in style, and that he's very meticulous, yeah. disciplined. Uh, you know, a, a great artist on the drums. Jeremy is like a complete mess, <laughs> but but just completely inspired. He's so. I yeah. mean, it's it's almost a cliche. You know, people say Keith Moon style, but Jeremy is definitely. He he just he just has moments where he just taps into something, yeah. which is so inspiring, um, and he's a little bit more unpredictable in that sense. Yeah, you know? yeah, he definitely tapped into it on that yeah. track. That's for yeah. sure. So, yeah, speaking of Nowhere Now, um, a music video was shot for that yes. song. Uh, so, can you tell us a bit more about that? I just saw the first cut that Lassa delivered last week. It's amazing. I mean, uh, it's me roaming around Chile in a leather jacket and dark glasses, looking, looking like a right rock star cliche. <laughs> but, you, you know, it, the scenery is so extraordinary. I think that the, the video, the star of the video is the scenery. We're very, yeah. very lucky to do it. The reason I ended up wearing the leather jacket and the dark glasses is because I mean, we're 5,000 metres above sea level yeah. and you have two things to contend with. Firstly, the sunlight is so dazzling yeah. uh, that you have to wear sunglasses. But yeah. on top of that, it's freezing. 
Is it really cold out there? It's mu- it's below zero. So wow. and the wind and and I, of course I had completely in complete ignorance. I hadn't figured any of this out before <laughs> I went there. <laughs> So I was thinking I'm going to be up there with, you know, just with my normal glasses, just a T-shirt or something. And I ended up having to wear the dark glasses and the leather jacket just to survive. But uh, So I look like a bit of a rock and roll cliche in the video, unfortunately. <laughs> but, but it's beautiful. And, and some of the locations uh, in the Atacama Desert are, are mind-blowing. Um, just, uh, or, I mean, just almost impossible to conceive that, that places like that exist on this planet until yeah. you see them. And in a way, that was beautiful for the song because the song is about it is it's it's, it's kind of about that. It's about the verses are about looking at the ver- at the earth from a, a very sort of um, earthly perspective. But then yeah. the chorus is this thing about rising above the planet and and being above the clouds and looking down the earth and seeing it that kind of David Bowie moment in a way, seeing it as this beautiful thing, this incredible gift to to not just the human race but to all the species that live on it and and I think the Atacama Desert kind of is a place where you really feel that in a, in a very strong way yeah. that our planet is so extraordinary yeah. and living in Hemel Hempstead as I do I'm not necessarily always <laughs> conscious of that you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah so um, I noticed actually uh, you actually visited the observatory uh, there so how did that come about? Yeah, we visited two observatories. We visited the one in uh, Paranel and the one in Alma. And, and I'm, I'm very ignorant of these things, but they're two very different. One, I think, is radio wave based and one is, is telescope based. That much I think I do understand. Um, so they're very different, but they're both basically doing similar things, which is exploring the, the, the very dark you know, recesses of, of what we can see from, from the Earth. The answer to the question is, how did it come about? I'm, I mean, I'm very lucky that I have people that like my music um, all over the world now, and they have some of them have incredible jobs. Yeah. And one of these people that had this really fascinating job was a guy called Simon Lowry, who, who worked in the Atacama Desert uh, at Paranel and, and Alma, and um, extended the invitation to me. Basically, he extended the invitation just to visit, you know, just for, yeah. just for fun to see... But of course, me being me, yeah. and I started to talk about it with Lassa, and I said, wouldn't it be amazing if we could actually shoot a video here? And originally, yeah. we talked about shooting a live Blu-ray there, yeah. but it wouldn't have been possible for the reasons of that I mentioned, the temperature, the, yeah. the, the thinness of the air. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you have, to have, you, know, you have to have an oxygen mask just to take a gasp every now and then because yeah. the air is so thin up there. So I'm glad we didn't go down that route, but but then we kind of settled on this idea, well, why don't we just shoot a video? And Nowhere Now seemed like the perfect, because of the theme yeah. of the song, it seemed like the perfect song yeah. to do it. Yeah, I mean, I can give you an example, because um, actually, well, just the harsh conditions, uh, there's a band called Tesseract, and they actually filmed a video in the North Pole. Wow. Um, well, it was actually, like, they sort of did like a sort of mini concert, but it, they only managed to get through three or four songs, because they were all just so cold doing it. Right. Um, but it is, it's well, imagine it, imagine yeah. the temperature and the thinness of the air, the altitude, five thousand yeah. meters above yeah. above sea level. You know, I mean, yeah. I don't know how many songs. I mean, I was just mi- I was just miming to nowhere now. But even yeah. just miming, I was out of breath yeah, after breath. after yeah. half a song. So, yeah. God knows what it'd be like shooting a two hour DVD. <laughs> you know. So um, yeah, just while we're on the topic of videos, I mean, uh, you know, have you got any plans for the live visuals for the tour yet? Have you even thought about that yet? Or that's <laughs> another. Th- that's another thing we start doing now, and and um, um, I have got some ideas. Is the simple answer, um, and. Um, I mean, I think maybe we touched on this last time we did the, the Facebook Live thing. I mean, I do want to take the show up a, a notch in terms of... Um, I mean, it's already very visually immersive and very ambitious, but being the kind of person I am, I'm always looking to you know to, to change things up and to make things better, bigger and better. So we're starting to think about the, the, um, the way the show, the production, and mm-hmm. how we can get the best content for the production. One of the things that annoys me slightly sometimes when I go to shows is that bands, artists have screens yeah. and they have projections, but they've got really nothing to show on them. Yeah. You know, yeah. as if you forgot to actually film anything that we yeah. worth worth showing. Yeah. You know, some just some fractals and some yeah. a logo yeah. going round and yeah. round and round. You know, <laughs> yeah. or some shots of uh, of some forest. You know. Or they have like close-ups of the people on stage, and they sort of project them onto the screens, behind yeah. so people in the top row can see. Exactly, you know. yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just some, st- you know, some f- 
shots of the sea or you know yeah. some ripples in a in a pond yeah uh, you know who you are who i'm talking about anyway okay so i think to myself well you know you've put all this effort and money and money and and and, and resources into having these incredible screens and but then you've really got no content that people yeah. really want to see so that was one of the reasons why you know i ended up approaching people like jess jess cope yeah. and and she's working on two new animations wow. uh, for for the show, specifically for the show. Although I'm sure we'll end up, uh, you know, releasing them. And again, I think with Jess, the same principle I've applied to everything on this album. Really, I didn't want to just do, and she didn't want to just do routine part two or, or yeah. drive home part three. You know, so she's doing two quite different things. She's using different types of of animation. Mm -hmm. um, to create something very different from from what she's done for me before, so they're going to be a big part of, of the show for sure. And Lass is working on some new material too. Fantastic. I mean, well, you mentioned Jess Cope. Uh, there's going to be the uh, the video game that's coming out at the end of the month. Yeah. Uh, last day of June. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, how did how did that actually come about? How did you sort of get involved with that? I mean, because it's obviously something that's very different to anything you've done before. I mean, the simple answer is I didn't get involved because I, I haven't been involved. I mean, there there is a there is going to be a soundtrack album or at least a Spotify kind of album playlist coming out, but it's all it's all of the music is our uh, alternate versions, alternate mixes, or alternate edits of music that that mm -hmm. that is already out there. Some of it's it's bass communion. Excuse me. Some of it is bass communion music. Some of it is is my solo music. Um, it's all instrumental. Um, basically, what happened is I think um, the guys that created the game saw the drive home video um, a couple of years ago, and and thought there was some. Obviously, fell in love with with Hayo's characters and, and and Jesse's animation and the story and the kind of feeling of the video, and thought there was. The foundations there for a, a, a computer game yeah. now when I heard this I'm like no of course not it, it's yeah, because my idea of, of computer games was like because I don't play computer games, computer games my idea of computer games was like you know Grand Theft Auto and you know yeah. uh, burning looting raping shooting you know all that stuff yeah. and <laughs> I thought there's no you can, there's not a game here but I was assured that there was this new wave of um, much more sophisticated you know um, mature, for want of a better word, um, and very beautiful role-playing games, and, and uh, so I, at that point, I just said, "Sure, you know, if if you want to go ahead and 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 try." And I gave them a bunch of of music, instrumental music, and the simple answer to your question is: uh, for the next two years, I was not involved until yeah. they said the game's finished. Would you like to come and see it? Yeah, and I'm like. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I went. What were you, you expecting to see? I mean, you know. I don't really know. Yeah. I d because I, I don't know. I don't think I even had a. I don't even think I had a, a preconception, because I literally had no parameters or reference point at all. Yeah. So I didn't know what I was going to see. Yeah. And and I went up there uh, with Jess and, and and we saw we watched. I mean, I didn't play the game, but we watched somebody else play the game, and I found it incredibly moving yeah. and, and and I didn't I mean you know it's it's my song I know the story already yeah. uh, I knew the characters um, I mean the story slightly changed obviously for, for the sake of the game it's slightly different but yeah I, I was really moved and, and in the way that I would have been moved by a movie experience and to me it felt like I'd watched a movie um, obviously that you know it, it's there is the the you know the the person playing the game can influence the game but yeah. i was watching someone else play the game so in a sense i was watching them in the movie and it has an incredibly powerful emotional kick to the end of the story which is actually different they they've changed the end of the story to 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 the end of the story in so the you've story. actually seen the game from start to end then i've seen the end uh, yeah and, and it's uh it's a really heartbreaking yeah. end in a good way uh, in a way that you know, if people are like my music, they're used to that kind of heartbreak. You know, yeah. and they've created a new kind of twist to the ending. Uh, it's really powerful, and the animation itself is is stunning. I'm yeah, so I've, I've, I've seen it. I mean, it looks you know unlike any other game that I've seen. Does it in terms, it? Of, in terms oh, of art style okay. and just general direction? I mean, it has like a kind of painterly approach to it, doesn't right. it? And it just looks right. 
It looks so beautiful. When you're it look, it, at it, it looks yes, it reminds me more of some animated videos I, yeah. I've seen. You know, yeah. some of the stuff that comes out of Japan, for example, Studio Ghibli stuff. You know, that's yeah, stuff. yeah. The Red Turtle and those kind of things, and it's got that very cinematic, like you said, that very painterly quality to mm -hmm. it. And everything, everything in the frame is so, um, is so beautifully realised. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost like you are inside a painting yeah. uh, the whole time. Um, I, you know, I don't know if, it, if, if what kind of market there is for those kind of games. I don't think they know either because <laughs> uh, they, they've done, never done anything quite like it either. But it's getting amazing reviews, as I yeah. understand, and a lot of attention because partly because I think it is so different. Yeah. Um, but as we know, you know, as we know from the music industry, just because something is really different and fresh and good, it doesn't necessarily mean it will find an audience. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sometimes quite the opposite in fact but fingers crossed um, and the soundtrack I, mean, I, I edited it all together and it, it works really lovely uh, beautifully as, as a kind of uh, a listening experience because it's yeah. definitely the, it's definitely on the sadder side of my yeah. of my music yeah. and I've never heard all of that music kind of together without the vocals and, and um, uh, yeah it's, it's, it works really lovely yeah I mean I, I really look forward to playing it mm. so uh, um, so you've, you've had to say some things about playlists in the past. Um, I've been sort of following your Headphone Dust playlist and I noticed that you added uh, the track Supermarine by Hans Zimmer yeah. on the Dunkirk film soundtrack. Yeah. Um, have you seen that film? And it's what, amazing. What do you think of it? Yeah, you think it's good? It's amazing. Yeah, I love yeah. It. I'm a massive Christopher Nolan fanboy anyway. Yeah. I think when I picked my 20... You remember a few couple of years ago, I picked my 20 favourite movies and he was the only director that had two... In, yeah. in the top 20 I picked. did you put the prestige in that prestige and, and it's and such it's an amazing film. film amazing film I love that film amazing yeah. and I could easily have put Memento in there as well yeah. you know so uh, there could have been three in there you know but I I, I, I think he's a genius and I, yeah. I, th I think what is so amazing about Christopher Nolan is he makes you know and this is what everyone says so I'm not seeing anything that, that, isn't, that hasn't been said before but I'll say it anyway he makes movies that are on a scale equal to any blockbuster you could see. Yeah. But they are so smart, intelligent, yeah. sophisticated. They don't, they don't take the audience's intelligence for granted. Uh, you know, no, let me rephrase that. They don't. Uh, what's the, what's the way I, the way I want to put this? They don't make assumptions about the audience that the audience aren't intelligent enough to realise yeah. what's going on. Yeah, That's definitely. kind of what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So you, you take a movie like Dunkirk, there's hardly any dialogue in that movie. Yeah. There, there, there's three interlocking stories, all in their own sort of different time frame, time zone. And I love the way Chris Nolan is fascinated by this idea of time and, and, and you know, um, playing with time. And he does it again in Dunkirk. But to do that in a in a Second World War movie, you know, it's yeah. just that that kind of ambition, um, and the soundtrack is and the sound design. I think uh, similarly to someone like David Lynch, uh, he's a director that completely understands the Absolutely. importance of sound and music in yeah. a movie, um, in a way that's you know that just blows me away. Yeah, speaking yeah. of Lynch, have you caught up on Twin Peaks at all? You, I'm, you, st you know, since the last time we did it, I've still not got any further. So you're only four episodes in? Four episodes, yeah. 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 I've been kind of busy, Rob. I've Just a little bit busy. busy. Yeah, I've yeah. been a little bit busy. But I've, I, got, I got to the point where I thought to myself, I'm so far behind now, you know what, yeah. I'm just going to wait until it's out on Blu-ray. Yeah. And then I'm just going to... You can experience the whole thing then, can't you? And yeah. then I can just watch it, yeah. you know, totally. as, as a whole yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah, so on the playlist, I mean, like, how do you decide uh, what you're going to listen to and how do you discover new music? I mean, I discover new music the same way that anyone discovers new music. People recommend me things. Yeah. Um, I, I, follow, I follow the trail. You know, yeah. I, one, thing, one thing I've always said, you know, and I, don't, I think this is one thing that has never changed about the world of pop music and rock music, is that even when I was growing up, long before there were things like Spotify and... and uh, you know, Amazon, people who bought this also bought that, you know. Long before any of that stuff, there was a way to follow the trail. So if you were really into an artist, you know, artist A, and you would read an interview with that artist, and that artist would be talking about the music that inspired them, and that would send you off to investigate artists B, C and D, you know. So I followed the trail. I, I remember, you know, I was really into bands like The Cure and, mm -hmm. and Joy Division when I was a kid. And I remember reading the, of them talking about 
Kraut Rock, you yeah. know, and bands like, you know, Noi and Can and Faust. And I, of course, the first thing I did is I went down to my local library yeah. and ordered some, so, uh, some Can records. And, and it's this, it's always been that way. You know, if, if you, you know, if you were reading an interview with, I don't know, the guys from Yes, and they'd be talking about Miles Davis and, you know, yeah. and, and, or... Prokofiev, you know, Sibelius, you know, and classical stuff. So I think that that thing about no music comes from a vacuum. All music comes from somewhere. And if you investigate where that music has come from, the influences and the inspirations behind that music, you find other music. And in that in turn leads to more music. And I like to think in my own little way, I introduce my fans perhaps that, that don't probably aren't aware of all my reference points in, in some of this music. I mean, for example, on To The Bone, Maybe not everyone that's listening to The Bone is familiar with Tears for Fears, Talk Talk, Kate yeah. Bush, which are very strong reference points on this record. Yeah, definitely. Uh, not that I've copied them, but I think, you know, if you're familiar with them, you can hear that there's definitely a kind of philosophy that, have, you know, that's, that I've kind of adopted that those guys have. And if somebody goes out and listens to Tears for Fears bec because of my record, then then job done, you know. That's that, And that's, that's the way I, you know, discover music too. Yeah, so actually, while we're on the subject of The Bone, uh, you commented that this record hasn't hasn't really got a core concept. Um, there are, however, some strong underlying themes that resonate with society today, um, and the record is perhaps a reflection of the world we find ourselves in. Uh, do you find the lack of a core concept a challenge in the songwriting process, or has it been liberating for you? Um, uh, it's a good question. I, I <laughs> you know, I, I hadn't thought about it. Um, I think once you've decided you've got a, a theme that runs through a record, that then at least you've kind of, you, 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 by then you kind of know, um, you don't have that question mark, what am I going to write a song about today? Because you kind of already know what the, the subject is and it's just a question of telling the story. And I need to, and, you know, I need to tell this part of the story now, so I need to write this part of the, the, the concept. I didn't, so I didn't have that this time. So in theory, every time I, I had a blank page, metaphorically speaking, um, I could fill it with anything. I could yeah. I could fill it with a song about, as I did about the refugee crisis or or about you know um, religious fundamentalism or you know something else, and but I but I did I did you know write this album lest we forget I'm sure no one will forget what's been going on in the last two years I did write this album in a particularly shall we say interesting time for yeah. the human race yeah. and there was no shortage of stuff to be angry about and to be disappointed about whether it was mm -hmm. brexit or the political situation i'm not going to mention names um uh or or the terrorist attacks you know so people who eat darkness for example was written straight after what happened to the bataclan in paris in, in november 2015 and was one of the first songs i wrote for the record so that's a direct response to something that's happening in the world that we live in and i think that happened several times during the during the process uh, of ma of making the record and as has happened so often before with me i got about two-thirds into writing the album thinking there wasn't a concept and realized that there kind of was yeah it's it, all of the songs are about this idea of the human race creating their own reality and creating their own idea of truth and the album starts with a quote about truth. And I think it's fascinating that what, you know, the, the idea that everyone, every religious fundamentalist believes they, they have the one true reality. Uh, every, um, you know, every politician believes they have the one true reality. Yeah. Every, you know, I think there's something about human beings that we create our own reality and then we call it the truth. Yeah. And it's not the truth at all. It's perspective. Yeah. We all have a perspective. And it got me thinking, towards the end of the album, I started to think, well, is there really, is this, is this, is this thing we call truth really achievable? Or is yeah. it, isn't it just a idealistic, abstract concept? Because truth is impossible. Yeah. Because your truth is your truth. Yeah. And your truth is filtered through your gender, your race, your religion, your politics, your upbringing, your the colour of your skin, all of those... All of those things affect your reality and your truth. So the album became... All of the songs, I think, are about perspective. Mm -hmm. Perspective that kind of um, 
manifests itself as truth. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. So I mean, you've got that uh, that voice clip at the start of the album. Yeah. Uh, so how did that come about? Like, who's who's talking on that? That's a very good friend of mine, uh, Jasmine. Uh, some some of my American fans will know Jasmine because she's a real character, and, and you can't miss her <laughs> when she comes to the show. She's uh, she's super good looking for a start, but you don't see many black girls at my shows. And Jasmine is a, a, a black girl, and she's she's a school teacher in Texas. So she's got all this stuff going on. So she understands something about the nature of truth and, and the nature of, of, of prejudice, uh, you know, and all of those things that come when you're a black school teacher working in Texas, you know. And she comes to my shows, and, and she's not, um, let's just say, that, you know, she's quite, un- she's quite an unusual sight at one of my shows. I wish it wasn't the case, but it is the yeah. case that... You know, not not a lot of people, you know, like Jasmine would, would come to one of my shows. And it's amazing, and I love it. And we got to become really good friends. And she, obviously, she's very smart. Um, she's a very qualified, intelligent, smart girl. And, and she's, um, she's also very outspoken and very, very opinionated in a good way. Mm-hmm. And I said to her one day, I want, I want, you know, you're, you, obviously you're in a very specific situation. Uh, doing what you do and being who you are I want you to talk to me about you know what you've experienced in terms of perspective and prejudice and and truth Um, and she she didn't take much encouraging she was straight (laughs) she she sent me uh, a few amazing clips where she was just basically talking in stream of consciousness and what I loved about it was that it was stream of consciousness it wasn't scripted it was just purely her and when when she started to talk about it, she had a lot to say. You know, she was talking about the black rights. Originally, she was talking about Black Lives Matter, and I said, "Well, Jasmine, I think that's really specific to you, but I would love this to be something which is not so specific. I would like it to be something that's more, in a way, more universal about the nature of truth and perspective." Mm-hmm. So she came up with that great speech, which is, I think, is absolutely spot on and absolutely perfect. Which is that idea that that a lot of there are a lot of people out there that their their impulse when they have created their own reality is to go and destroy everyone else's reality that doesn't chime yeah. with theirs, and that really is uh, that for me is the crux of the whole matter, yeah. and that's isn't that isn't that religion in a nutshell yeah, and religious fundamentalism yeah. in a nutshell. Yeah. We believe this, you disagree with us, so we're going to kill you, um, yeah. and and I think that in a way that goes through a lot of other aspects of, of human behaviour as well, you know. So anyway, so she, she sent me that, that um, quote and it just it became the perfect way to, to start the record. I think. Yeah, it's a really nice way to start the record, I've got to say. Mm. So, uh, yeah, going back to the sort of uh, the 80s sort of influences uh, that, that you have on the album, um, I've noticed recently there's been somewhat of a resurgence in 1980s culture, um, mainly popularised by the TV show Stranger Things. I don't know if you're aware of that show. Have you ever seen that? I haven't. No. Yeah, definitely watch that show. Cause, okay. Uh, it's basically like what you'd get if you were to combine, say, the skills of Steven Spielberg, John Carpenter, you know, a, a lot of those sort of 80s directors. Right, that, you know, okay. It's got kind of like a... Um, so have you ever seen E.T.? Basically that sort of yeah, vibe. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it's also quite Twin Peaks as well. Like there's okay. a sort of an element of mystery in there as well. So okay. I think you'd be right if you're straight. All right, sounds good. A sort of tour bus viewing for me. Because I, I never yeah. get time to watch yeah. TV when I'm at home. But when I go on tour, yeah. suddenly you've got all those hours on the tour yeah. bus and that's when you sort of devour yeah. you know, box sets of things yeah. you've missed the first time around. What other stuff have you watched on the tour bus? Like? Um, wow, it's been a while since I was on tour. What was it? Um, you know, um, oh, no, oh you're watching Toast, of, Le- Toast of London. Toast Matt of Barry. London. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Toast of London is, yeah. is basically my favourite TV show of the last yeah. 10 years. Uh, it's just funny as hell. No. We, we, we kept watching, all the guys in the band love it. We kept watching those over and over again. No, I watched, I watched The Leftovers. Oh, yeah. I watched The Leftovers. I watched the first two seasons of The Leftovers on the last American tour. And that was yeah. really interesting. I mean, that, that's definitely, you know, you, I think there's a certain, there's a whole generation of TV shows now, I think, which obviously show how things have changed since Twin Peaks um, and how Twin Peaks completely changed the landscape of what you could do with television. Um, I think we I think we mentioned it last time when we, when we did this that, that, that there's a lot of shows that, that kind of pay lip service to Twin Peaks but then when you see the real, the real yeah, Twin no, Peaks yeah, yeah. you realise that there's a whole <laughs> other level 
that yeah. these shows can only dream of, you know. Yeah. But I think the influence, that, that sort of non-linear storytelling, that tapping into what you would call dream logic, the logic of dreams. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier with Christopher Nolan. I mean, obviously yes. he's really big on linear narratives. Yes, yeah, so. and also he does tap into dream logic as well. Yeah. And, and I love that, and it's all it's shot right through my music. It always has been. And uh, it's fascinating to see that the whole the new generation of television that's kind of inspired by that whole kind of way of doing things. I love it. Yeah, yeah the leftovers has got really beautiful music. I've got to say. It's yeah, Max Richter. Max Richter again. One, again, yeah. one of my favorite artists. In yeah. fact, one of my top five albums yeah. of the year is going to be a Max Richter album. I, yeah. I listened sure. to that record by the way after you mentioned it in the last Q and A. The Virginia Woolf one. Yeah. Oh, stunning. It's amazing. Stunning. Yeah. yeah. So so good. I think the soundtrack to Dunkirk, the the Max Richter, the, the Virginia Woolf album, that those two are definitely going to be in my top five for the yeah. year, unless an extraordinary glut of amazing records comes out <laughs> between now and then. Yeah. So I've got one final question for yeah. you. Do you think you're going to be number one on Friday? Um, I doubt it. Uh, and, and I only say that because, um, th th just to explain to people who maybe haven't thought about this, I mean, I had never thought about it until I had to, you know, think about it. What happens is an artist like me, I'm, a, I'm what you call a, a, a cult artist, you know, so what happens is, is that my fans, they all go out and buy the record on the first day which means that your first day sales are phenomenal. But the problem is that when you go up against people like Ed Sheeran and Elvis yeah. Presley, who are selling every day, what, what you call the supermarket shopper's choice, you know, yeah. they're selling every day, day in, day out, they sell 2,000 copies every day in the UK, then as the week progresses, these people gradually, even though I've had the most amazing first day sales, my fans, after they've bought it on the first day, um, you know they're not going to go go out and buy it, you know, another six times. Yeah. So I have to rely on on you know the the sales kind of ticking over throughout yeah. the rest of the week. Yeah. But then people like Elvis Presley and John Denver and Glenn Campbell and these sort of greatest hits albums, where they just sell every day, you know, consistently, and they're all catching up. They haven't caught. I'm still number one today. Where are we today? Oh, it's Wednesday, Wednesday day, isn't yeah. it? Uh, but they're re they're right on my heels. Yeah, I would be really happy if I'm in the top five. Yeah, I mean that would be amazing. Yeah, it'd be the highest chart position you've ever had. It, on that. it would be amazing yeah. if I was top five, and, and ditto in Germany and Holland and all these places. I mean, you know, to be top five, and I don't, I'm still very much, uh, you know, um, someone that exists outside of the mainstream. So. Mm -hmm. That sends an incredible message to to the main to the rest of the yeah. the world. You know, here's yeah. an artist you 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 know you you kind of overlooked him, but you know yeah. what? He was number one midweek, and he's going to be in the top five. Yeah. Um, so it, it's kind of a it's a it's a it's a vindication in a way. But the answer to the question is, there's always hope. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a remote hope. It's seeing seeing the chart today and seeing like Ed Sheeran and Elvis like literally they're like two hundred sales behind me now. Yeah. Yeah, but don't let me stop the audience out there from going out and buying another <laughs> <laughs> another five thousand copies of to the bone between now and and, and, and Thursday at midnight. You know. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's everything now. Okay. So, uh, thanks so much for your time, Stephen. Thank you. You're crazy busy at the moment. And thanks to everyone that's been listening to the bone and 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 enjoying it or not enjoying it. We're listening anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much.